Hey there, my name's Curtis Lucas and you're watching Empire Building. So the thing I wanted to talk about in this video is altcoins, namely Dogecoin, for obvious reasons. I mean, let's face it, the reality is, while we're sitting here investing in these Bitcoin mining companies that frankly feel like they've been under attack for a couple of months, while at the same time we see altcoins like Ethereum and Dogecoin making massive gains. It does beg the question, what are we missing? Maybe we should be buying those instead. So in this episode, I am gonna focus in on Dogecoin itself and let's see, and let's talk about whether or not it makes sense as an investment. And for that, we're gonna to have to answer a few very important questions. We're gonna to need to look at why Dogecoin is going up. What problem is Dogecoin solving? And what role is Dogecoin going to be taking in our future? For me, these are three very important questions you should be able to answer regardless of what you're investing in. And with that, let's get into the video. So the reality is, looking back in time with the benefit of hindsight, what would one dollar invested in Dogecoin one year ago resulted in in terms of profit today? Referring to CoinGecko, it appears that a one year return would have been $24,000 roughly. $24,000 for every dollar invested one year ago. This is unreal. And frankly, in my opinion, this is somewhat a shadow of things to come. I'm not saying that anyone invested in Bitcoin mining stocks is going to see a $24,000 or 24,000% return. That is unreasonable. But the point I'm making here is it is not unreasonable for the price to rise higher than anybody expects. Certainly, most people did not expect this to actually happen. The last time during the last bull cycle, the highest that Dogecoin ever got was about eight cents. So what exactly is happening here? I mean, we're all aware that it's a meme coin. We're all aware that it started out as a joke. It was never meant to be taken seriously. It's a lighthearted, fun currency that people can get behind without having to get so serious about it. But when you got this much money on the line, it gets pretty serious. But what is causing this? Frankly, it's quite simple. It's a matter of adoption and popularity at this point. And in that sense, Bitcoin really is no different. It just happens to be a whole lot more adopted and a whole lot more popular than Dogecoin. But then you also have to ask yourself, what problem is it solving? This part for me is somewhat unclear. Bitcoin has a very clear narrative that it is going to be a store of value and it is a currency for the internet. A way for people to transact with one another across borders without censorship. And it has already reached the critical mass necessary for it to be considered successful. By comparison, Dogecoin, while somewhat successful, considerably successful, it is still with a market cap somewhere about, well, let's have a quick look. Dogecoin's market cap sits somewhere about just, just under $80 billion. When compared with Bitcoin's market cap, that is a whole trillion dollars more than that. So obviously, this is no threat to Bitcoin in any way, shape, or form. It certainly maybe takes away the attention for a period of time, but again, we also have to go back and answer the question, what is the problem that Dogecoin is solving? As it stands right now, I don't necessarily see it as solving any problems, but it does have an incredible amount of popularity. Recently, I was listening to a talk that Andreas Antonopoulos did at the Bitcoin conference in Texas back in 2014. Now, at the time, Dogecoin was really only around for about a year. But Andreas had some very interesting things to say about what it takes for a currency to attain value. Not intrinsic value, but perceived value. But here's the point. Currencies emerge 
when you have the social structure for currencies to emerge. And the reason the currencies are emerge in that manner is because currencies are a form of communication. Currency is a language. It is a language that allows people to exchange information about value. Not always monetary value. It's about value of friendship. It's about value of popularity. It's about value of celebrity. It's about value of brand. And all of these things have value, not necessarily monetary value. And currencies are the language by which this value is expressed. So now, seven years later, we're witnessing this effect take place. Dogecoin has surged in popularity, mainly due to the fact that people have gotten behind this story of it being a fun cryptocurrency that no one needs to take seriously. It was never meant to be taken seriously, and its value has been reflected in that surge in popularity. But in my opinion, that's only one part of the equation. It also needs to solve a problem. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, that problem has been well identified. And Bitcoin is solving it very well as we speak. But Dogecoin isn't here to solve the same problem. It was never designed to. But that doesn't mean it can't have value. The question that we're going to be asking ourselves is how much value does it deserve for the problem that it potentially solves? It doesn't solve the same problem as Ethereum, just as Bitcoin doesn't solve the same problem as Ethereum. And each of these problems, in my opinion, is where we'll be able to determine what value these currencies are warranted, at least over time, once the popularity fades, because this will come as well. So we now live in a new world where we will have millions of coins and some of them will be Joey coin and Maria coin and Kanye West coin and some of them will be really important coins in the world financial environment. And here's the funny thing. We'll have no idea when one turns into the other. Because the line between a coin that's a fad and a coin that has monetary value is simply an adoption threshold. It's an issue of critical mass. At some point, the network effect, the viral adoption patterns of a currency, become big enough within a locality that that currency acquires monetary value. And it acquires monetary value because increasingly the majority of the people you interact with speak the language of that currency by exchanging it for other things of value. And we will have no idea how to distinguish between the two. The other thing is it's not going to end with Dogecoin. This isn't the end of that story. There's going to be this type of effect. It's going to happen over and over and over again. As Dogecoin falls, another one will rise. We don't really know which one's going to be next and to what extent they will rise. And with time, they're all going to find their place. This is the new world we live in. This is how value will be assigned for the future of monetary systems. It's no longer solely up to the sovereign nations to assign the value and control the monetary system of those currencies. All of these currencies are going to be competing with one another based on the problem that they're solving and the market that they're addressing. Imagine a world where a decade from now, a Central African Republic has de facto adopted, through use of more than 50% of its GDP, as its national currency, Dogecoin. And not a single person in that country has any idea what that silly dog is doing on their coin. <laughs> but guess what? Most of those African countries had no idea what that silly white old lady was doing on their money. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. And there is absolutely no difference between the two. The In terms of monetary value, the important thing for the user of that currency is... Can I take this token of abstract value and get a dozen eggs with it? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the reality is this is the new world that we live in. 
Now, I don't know if some African nation is actually going to adopt Dogecoin as a de facto currency by the 40% of their population utilizing Dogecoin. It's possible. It could also happen anywhere else in the world. And if that does happen, then yes, it would have solved a problem. Now, that's not what's happening today. What's happening today is more along the lines of the popularity of it. It is gone viral. But the solely built, fueled by popularity is not enough to trigger that adoption, to actually utilize it to solve these kinds of problems. But over time, this could take place. And the fact is, it's happened before. I'm actually amazed by the foresight that Andreas Antonopoulos has in his ability to sort of see this development taking place. Seven years in the past, he talked about this. That's when this video was recorded. I'm going to leave a uh, link in the description down below if you want to watch the entire thing. I highly recommend when you do watch it, watch the entire video. The question and answer period at the end of his talks are sometimes the most valuable portions of those videos because the people that attended these conferences, they asked very good, intelligent questions. And even though this was seven years ago, it is still valid today. And it's remarkable to see how much knowledge you can gain by going back to a time when these things weren't mainstream. The next thing he talks about is how currencies can evolve and gives a pretty good example of how one has happened in the past where a currency was adopted by a population that was never intended to be operated as a currency. We've seen this happen before. And PESA started as a means for families to exchange cell phone minutes. And one day someone went to a store and said, I don't have any money, but I have two minutes left on my cell phone. If I give you a minute, can you give me three eggs? And a currency was born. And 11 years later, M-Pesa represents 40% of the GDP of Kenya, and it was never designed to be a currency. Currencies are not created from sovereignty. Currencies emerge as a cultural art artifact, as a means of conversation, as a language with which we express value to each other. So in my opinion, the important thing always to look at is that the currencies or whatever it is that we're interested in, whatever cryptocurrency or blockchain technology that interests you, it's important that you evaluate what market that currency is addressing. That blockchain technology. If it's Ethereum with smart contracts, NFTs, decentralized finance, there's a whole host of things and problems that Ethereum is trying to solve. And it's not the only one trying to do it. Bitcoin takes the throne as far as store of value and medium of exchange that has already grown to an adoption threshold that I think it will maintain for the foreseeable future. And I'll take it one step further. Now that we have cryptocurrencies, it's not sovereignty that creates currency. It is currency that will create sovereignty. But it's Bitcoin that has opened the door to allow this new world, this new future to even exist. A future where currency will no longer only be derived by sovereign nations. Currencies will be derived by mass adoption based on their own network effects and the problem that they're solving. By adopting Bitcoin on the internet, we are for the first time creating the internet sovereign currency. The purchasing power of Bitcoin at internet scale creates sovereignty for the internet. It creates an international, transnational, financial mega power. And we're building that right now. And we don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin or Dogecoin or any of the other coins, but it doesn't really matter. Because monetary value is not created at issuance anymore. It's created over time through adoption. So you can see that as far as technology is concerned, as far as this groundbreaking paradigm shifting technology that Bitcoin first unleashed on the world. There's no telling which one of these 
uh, cryptocurrencies is actually going to last into this new future. I suspect Dogecoin probably will maintain a presence. It's certainly left its mark, achieving an overall market cap value that puts it in fifth place. I think it was actually at fourth place yesterday. That's not something that just goes away lightly. But as I said, you do need to understand what problem it was meant to solve. And it was not meant to solve the store of value problem. But as a technology, let's have a slightly closer look at it. This is the actual Dogecoin white paper. Uh, one of the things that many people don't realize about it is it is a fork off of Litecoin. It's not a fork off of Bitcoin. It does not run off the SHA-256 algorithm. This was done deliberately because they didn't want uh, Litecoin to be so easily attacked by the massive amount of Bitcoin hardware that's out there. Otherwise, you could guarantee that an event like this would have seen a massive amount of Bitcoin hardware suddenly turn to Dogecoin and could easily attack it and create double spends all day long. As far as issuance is concerned, there was always a plan for them to issue approximately 100,000, sorry, 100 billion coins uh, by early 2015. And then following that, the issuance was dropped down to about 10,000, exactly 10,000 coins per block. What this means is as time goes on, the, there will be a steady issuance, a constant issuance of new coins to be paid out to the miners for every block. So over time, the percentage of inflation will drop, but there is no maximum cap like there is with Bitcoin. The issuance of Dogecoin will continue into infinity with no maximum cap. Thereby, it does have a constant inflation, but the rate, the percent of inflation, meaning how long will it take for the amount of Dogecoin in circulation to double, will increase as time goes on. So theoretically, it could make an, a good currency for some to use because it's not meant to be a store of value. It's meant for people to actually spend because you're incentivized to spend anything that's going to lose value over time. But this brings me down to one of the criticisms that Bitcoin has received over the years is that governments around the world are not going to accept Bitcoin as a currency. And we've seen this take effect. This is why Bitcoin has been so much more successful as a store of value, as an asset, than it has been as a currency. It doesn't function very well as a currency and it's not trying to anymore. And I think that is what's led to its tremendous success. As an asset, it doesn't pose as much of a threat as it would if it was considered a currency. In my opinion, the governments of the world are not ready for that type of disruption. They'd be willing to allow it so long as it maintains a small enough market cap so as not to be too disruptive. So I would be wary in investing in something that his, its sole purpose for existence is that. If it got too big, it would be considered a threat and likely would face strict regulations that would make it very difficult to operate with it. Now, I realize this makes me sound exactly like everyone, like a Peter Schiff, who has had this exact argument against Bitcoin. But what he doesn't understand is that the governments of the world have identified and realized that Bitcoin is as useful to them as it is to the rest of the world. And it's no more a threat to national currencies as gold is, as real estate is, as stocks are, as far as storing people's wealth. The wealthy people of the world don't store their wealth in currency. That would be insane. The governments know this and they have no problem with that. So as long as Bitcoin maintains itself as a store of value instead of a currency, it will have a free pass to continue. I have further thoughts on this and I'll do another video on this, but this is an important question for us to ask as investors. We have to be able to understand what role Bitcoin and any blockchain Ethereum in particular, which is my largest cryptocurrency holding, what role are they going to take in a future that 
is intertwined with the existing financial infrastructure? How will it intermingle with future central bank issued cryptocurrencies? What kind of regulations and what, what format, what, what form will Bitcoin take in that kind of future? Because in my opinion, Bitcoin is going to change. It's not going to be the same Bitcoin it is today. And for some people, they're not going to like it. And the stage is already being set for that. We can see it happening in Mar itself that recently announced that they have finally begun uh, mining fully compliant Bitcoin by excluding from their blocks any transactions that are sourced from wallets that have been identified as off limits. As more and more governments adopt such practices and as more and more Bitcoin mining becomes institutionalized, it's going to squeeze out anybody else who can't compete, which will then make Bitcoin very institutional friendly, very government friendly. And they won't be breaking any of the consensus rules of Bitcoin to make that happen. Now, there are some that, like I said, may not like that, but that's, tech tech, that's the way the technology is written. And the more I've thought about it, that's the direction I could see this evolving into. But in that future, what role will something like Dogecoin solve? Well, what role will something like Dogecoin provide? I do think that it will continue to exist, but I don't see it taking a major position in terms of overall adoption. But I could be wrong about that. But I'm okay if I am wrong. I don't need to be a part of everything that's out there. And I don't need to be right about everything. I just need to understand what I'm personally investing in. And you all need to do the same. But you also need to ask yourself, do you really need to be investing in something that has a somewhat unsure future that's already risen 24,000% in one year? That's a decision only you can make. Well, that's all for this one. Now let's get back to empire building.